Hello and welcome to the Majlis, the weekly podcast by Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, focusing on Central Asia. I am Mohammed Tahir, your host here in Washington, D.C. After a couple of weeks of break, Majlis is back in session and today we are here to do a quick states update about the situation of forced labor in the latest cotton harvest in Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan is known for it is notorious practice of forcing it is citizens to pick cotton against their will. At the times, this used to involve over a million people, about which the authorities have been regularly criticized by the international community. But after the change in administration two years ago, the new government in Uzbekistan has promised to end this practice. And for that promise, they earned lots of goodwill and praise from around the world. As another harvest season has just ended, we are here to revisit the cotton fields of Uzbekistan to discuss how much the government has been good in its promise, what changed and what remains to be changed in this highly inhumane practice. To discuss all these, I'm joined by Umida Niyazova, Director of Uzbek German Forum for Human Rights, an NGO which monitors forced labor in Uzbekistan's cotton fields. Umida is joining us from Berlin. Uh, we have Jonas Astrup, uh, International Labor Organization's Chief Technical Advisor in Uzbekistan. Jonas is in Tashkent. Laziz Omilov, the editor of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty's Uzbek service. Azot League's reporting project on cotton called Pachtagram uh, is in Prague, along Bruce Panier, editor of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty's Central Asia blog, Kishlok Awazi. Welcome on board, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice to have you. So we also invited the Uzbek authorities to join the discussion. I did not get any response to my inquiries. And thanks, Jonas, for your f- efforts to get them on board. I think uh, we will continue trying. So anyhow, I just want to say that we are eager to hear from them. So let's move on. As I said, another harvest season has been just uh, concluded in the absence of the authorities in the show. Let's start with you, Jonas, how did the harvest go this year and how did the issues related to the forced labor were handled? I think that um, 2018 was a, a really exciting year for Uzbekistan, but perhaps it was also a test for the country. Uh-huh. I think when the when President Mizoyev uh, stood up in September 2017 in front of the UN General Assembly and committed the country to, to work with the ILO and to eradicate child and forced labor, he made a very public commitment. Right. He didn't have to do that. So 2018 was, a, was an exciting year. If we look at the uh, sort of, I'm just going to talk very, very high level and we can go into more detail. I'm sure the other uh, participants also have thoughts and, and views on, on these things. I think what we saw in, in 2018 was continued, clear political commitment. So if you followed the, the public announcements, the speeches, the TV shows, the uh, articles in newspapers and so on, you, you saw a clear commitment coming from the leadership of the country to eradicate child and forced labor. There's no ambiguity in the uh, messaging. In terms of specific measures taken, we saw a significant increase in wages for cotton pickers. We saw a very significant awareness raising campaign to make people aware of their labor rights and to promote the feedback mechanisms, the hotlines that people can contact if they have questions or concerns or cases. Those hotlines in 2018 Uh, handled well over two and a half thousand cases that were investigated by the uh, Ministry of Labor and the Federation Hmm. of uh, Trade Unions. And almost 200 officials were punished and uh, either dismissed, demoted or or fined. I think those are sort of quite key developments. The result, as as we saw it from from the ILO monitoring our preliminary findings, we saw a 46 percent reduction in forced labor in 2018. Now, I think it's really That's important. That's a very specific number, so we will get into this, where you get this we'll number. We'll get into this, yeah. but I, I just want to make absolutely clear that mm-hmm. we are in no way saying that there is no forced labor in, in Uzbekistan. Sure. There are still, in 2018, 180,000 people that were forced to pick cotton during the harvest. Okay. Laziz, uh, Lina said the, they have seen continued political commitment by the Uzbek authorities to uh, eradicate uh, this phenomena in Uzbekistan. I am more interested in how this commitment played out 
on the ground. So you and your colleagues at the Azatlik have been monitoring the situation throughout the season. So instead of me repeating your reports, let me invite you to talk about some of the highlights that you came across this year when it comes to the forced labor. So, yes, we also could notice that there was like big uh, state governmental campaign against forced labor. We could see that in newspapers, we could see that on social media and everywhere. So basically there were these hotlines, as Jonas is saying, everything is correct. But what we noticed in practice on the ground, two differences that we noticed to, to, to speak generally. First, we didn't see kids being taken to the fields. And we also saw that the government or the local government became more responsive to complaints and mm. problems report. But again, I'm talking only about the cases that we were covering because physically we were not able to, to report everything. But those cases that we were investigating and we were publishing, uh, normally the prosecutor's office was coming to us, talking to us and sending there the team and really trying to talk to those people. They were finding those people and trying to talk. We, we had a case once when two guys reported that they were from Angren, forcefully were taken to the cotton field. We published that, and probably two days after that, if I'm not mistaken, prosecutor's office contacted us back and said, look, guys, we saw those guys, we talked to them, everything is resolved, this guy is sent back home. But once we started contacting that guy again, he, he said, yes, well, they sent only me home. All my friends and colleagues are still there. And now I'm afraid because mm -hmm. those guys, they said, OK, we will talk to you after the cotton finished. So I would join what Jonas is saying, that the government is sort of trying. But in fact, the, the, the real business stays with the lo local government, which I will try to cite our followers who is saying that local government is sabotaging what president is doing. Okay. Uh, Omida, anything to add on this? Uh, you know, we heard uh, somewhat opposing perspectives from Laziz and Yunus, and I know you have been working on a comprehensive report on this. So what were your main findings from this year's harvest and where uh, we are in the matter of forced labor compared to the previous year or years? Uh, with regard to the recent harvest, we found forced labor remained a systematic problem. Uh, the government continued to impose cotton quota on uh, regions and districts and uh, imposing responsibility to fulfill this on officials. And in turn, these officials um, imposed quotas on public institutions, the like bank, enterprises, businesses to send employees or to pay for pickers. And we also found that hmm. teachers and healthcare workers in this year's uh, cotton harvest, they participated, also had been sent to be cotton, but uh, on the uh, less scale than in previous years. And we see the the real kind of problems that, for example, uh, with the onset of the cold weather, uh, the number of volunteers uh, has declined. And despite the increasing of payment for pickers, which was good, like up to 10 cents per one kilogram at the end of the season, huh. it was not been enough to attract a sufficient number of uh, voluntarily workers. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Bruce, uh, I guess, uh, you know, we had a similar discussion two years ago, uh, aside from the rhetoric by the authorities, promises of reform, etc. So what did change and what remains to be changed the way you see it? Certainly, you know, wages did go up. Uh, that was yeah. good. And yeah. there was, um, I think everyone agrees that there was less forced labor in Uzbekistan's cotton fields in 2018 than we saw in previous years. Um, the question for me, you know, all, all of last year was, we saw that when it, when officials got caught for forcing people into the cotton fields, that they were punished. Uh, when it, when, the, when this was made public, um, they were punished. Now, Amita mentioned that there still keeps the quotas on. And the, the chain of command to me is not, entirely clear. I'm trying to figure out, you know, the government, we know that the top people say, don't send people into the fields, we won't stand for it. And at the same time, somebody way up in government is saying, but we still need to get X amount of cotton from this region, that region, the other regions. Uh, and local officials still seem to interpret that as meaning that, that one way or another, they have to get that cotton in. And that includes uh, conscripting people into the fields if mm -hmm. that is what happens. So I see that people get punished when they get caught. Now, my question has been all along here, um, uh, how clear are these 
these orders about not putting people in the fields? Is this something that officials in Tashkent say? And as long as people, local officials can get away with sending people into the fields and, and getting them to pick cotton, and if nothing's spoken about it, then nothing changes. But the deal is if you get caught, the government in Tashkent will will not own up to you being part of, of any effort they've signed off on, meaning that they, the government, you know, Mirzi Oya of other people say, we told you not to do that. But behind closed doors, they're also saying, but you have to get it done any way that you you can get it done. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, are these people, local officials being made scapegoats because they're the ones that are caught are the ones that punished, but we know that others are not caught and mm-hmm. still seem to be doing the same thing that they had been doing under Karima for all those years. So it's, you, it's, it's really unclear to me. I, do you want, publicly, Bruce, against, do you, the government's against it. Bruce, do you want Jonas to respond to this? I mean, probably he knows what's going on behind the doors. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> I'd like to hear his opinion. Yeah. Well, thanks, Bruce, and thanks, Mohammed. Um, well, I don't know if I know everything that's going on. Let me let me try and ex- explain from our perspective and what mm. we saw in this year's harvest. There were clear instructions mm. to not force people. I don't think that there is a sort of closed door discussion. We, as the ILO, took part in all the cabinet of ministers' meetings. We are part of these um, discussions, and I really genuinely think that the, the instructions to the local government are clear. Now, at the same time, we should not underestimate the pressure that's on the local government. You know, cotton is still a significant crop for the country, and there are quotas in place. And of course, those targets have to have to be be met. So the, it's a challenging situation, and I don't envy the local government officials to deliver on, on under these conditions necessarily. But I think there is one issue, and this is one of our key recommendations that we have already submitted to the government at our roundtable in, in November. There is the issue of asking people to provide replacement picker fees. There is an issue about asking people for money, which we believe, and, and as far as we can see, is a significant driver in asking the wrong people, quite frankly, because the kind of people that you would attract with higher wages are people who need the extra income, people who are unemployed, you know, housewives, uh, women in rural areas, people who are, who are motivated by the opportunity to, to make money during the harvest. But the practice of asking somebody to pick cotton and if they decline, then say, well, then you have to pay me $100, for example. A student mm. or a woman in a rural area can't pay $100. Of course, yeah. So there's no incentive to ask these people to pick. If you really are looking for, how can I say, some, some you, you're really looking for, mm. for money rather than pickers. Mm. And, mm. and so we, we have made a crystal clear uh, recommendation from the monitoring in 2018. We've already communicated this to the government at, at the roundtable. Prohibits any type of payment or fees to be paid in relation to the cotton harvest in 2019. Okay. So uh, before I forget, earlier, Jonas, you mentioned that there was a 46% reduction in number of people forced to pick cotton this year. Umida, in terms of numbers, scope and size, was there any change this year? We assume that less people were mobilized, possibly mobilized Mm. to send cotton because this year there was less cotton produced. Mm. But nevertheless, I would say that we think that there are serious shortcomings in the ILO's methodology and conclusions. And there is a third-party monitoring evaluation, hmm. which was published last year, and which was published by Professor Christian Laslett. And I will not repeat, but it's a whole report which says that the contradictory and inaccurate information in the ILO's harvest report of 2017 indicates deficiencies in the field of quality control of the study. And I wanted to uh, return to the question of who are responsible for this and behind this systemic uh, mobilization of people to pick cotton. Uh, for example, I opened now this the document which says the, this is the order of the head of Uzbek Metallurgy Combinat in Bekabad city from September 19. And it says on the organization of the harvesting of raw cotton in 2019, which starts with the world on the basis of protocol number 3276 of the Cabinet of Ministers of Republic of Uzbekistan and decision of Hakim of the Tashkent to assist 
Big Abad district in harvesting cotton in 2018. So it's a whole big order. And uh, this order and this protocol was not published. And we don't know what's written there, but we know we interviewed employees of this Big Abad uh, metallurgy combinat who were told us that they were ordered to pick cotton and there was no any chance for them to refuse because they they, they don't want to conflict with the, the directors and just go to pick cotton. Okay. Also, before I not forget, I wanted to mention that, you know, this year, almost every day, the local media reported about the punishment or dismissal of Hakim, prosecutors, uh, police chiefs, tax inspectors for poor organizing harvesting or what, uh, the, what does that mean? Companies. Yeah, what does that mean? What that mean, for example, this means that these regions were not good enough to fulfill the cotton quota. Oh. Let me give you an example. For example, Tashkent region was the worst with the cotton quota. And as a result, we saw there was a publish that all the 22 heads of cities and districts of Tashkent region, uh, the Hokims, they have been punished. Uh, so the orders in the public, they, they don't say that we punishing Hakims for not fulfilling the quota. It says like general for the poor organizing cotton harvest. But nevertheless, if if we look this table, the information of cotton harvested uh, every day, we see that the regions are with the bad results, heads of that regions, they were punished. Mm -hmm. okay. And also, at the end, uh, let me also um, note that the ILO is claiming and Minister of Labor is claiming that more than 200 officials, they've been punished for using forced labor. The problem is we cannot confirm this information because the list of these officials, when, who were published, for what and how, it was never been published. Okay, so we uh, luckily we have ILO here. Um, and also, uh, you know, in terms of numbers, I think uh, what Umida said, there's a window for you to respond on that. Regardless of numbers, I hear both of you think that there was a reduction in number of people being forced to collect cotton this year. So just uh, quickly, uh, your response on this. Yes, absolutely. Let, let me let me respond very specifically to the issue about uh, punishment for forced labor violations. So I just got the latest numbers last week, in fact, from the ministry, because, of course, some of these cases are still ongoing after the harvest. So the, the exact number is 184 cases across the country, specifically uh, officials being punished for forced labor violations. Nothing else, nothing about quotas nothing about anything else. This is specifically about forced labor. I have the list with the names. I have the distribution across the provinces. We just need to find a good way to share this. I, I, I don't think it would be very ethical for me to put up a list with 200 names of individuals in, in the public domain. I certainly think we need to, to think about yeah. how we go about sharing the identity or to provide as much information as we can about these cases without violating people's rights to privacy and, 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 and so on. When we issue our report, I will make a commitment today that we will include that list in a way that we, we don't disclose people's identities. But we could perhaps go uh, do it by region, by province, by district, et, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, now, the other thing, I just, I, I mean, Mira, <laughs> Umila, you, you're more than welcome to disagree with our findings and you're more than welcome to have concerns or questions about our methodology. But it would be good if, if you were specific and I'd be very happy to answer any of your, your questions or any of your, your concerns. I, I can tell you that the 2017 monitoring was very different from the 2018 monitoring. So if, if you are thinking about the 2017 harvest, I think things have changed significantly in the way we do monitoring. So we, for example, don't do monitoring with any type of government or trade union officials in 2018. There are no FTUU representatives on the ILO monitoring team. There is only an international ILO monitor and the local human rights activist. Also, I can tell you that I can say that there is no attempt whatsoever to restrict or influence our monitoring. All uh, visits were unannounced and unaccompanied. And, and if you have any questions or any thoughts on, on this, I'm more than happy 
Yeah, I think uh, that's the topic of discussion for uh, another majlis or some some other platform that we might uh, you know get back to it. Just yeah, to I'm sorry, Muhammad. I'm, I'm sorry. I just want to quickly respond that actually we prepared the list of the questions uh, regarding the ILO methodology, and I am glad that Jonas is expressed his willingness to respond. And Great. this uh, list of questions will be sent to to him uh, tomorrow or yeah. Sounds, Thank sounds, you, Bida, and, and I commit to responding to that. Thank you. Sounds like a deal. Sounds like a deal. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we spoke about the punishments. Uh, a couple of you have raised that. Uh, let me bring some other uh, new thing that I have seen this year that you, you all might have seen some of those viral pictures in which farmers were forced to stand in, in ditches filled with cold water or were forced to run carrying heavy stones as a humiliating me- means of punishment for their failures in fulfilling tasks given by the authorities. How those pictures can be explained, Yunus, if the authorities are so strict in punishing violators of the rules that they put forward uh, in terms of cotton picking? Yes, I, th- I think I know which picture you are you are referring to, and I think for the benefit of the listeners to to the podcast, yeah. I mean, I assume that you are you are referring to the picture of people standing in in a stream of water. Is that yep. correct? Yep. One yes. is that, and so, the other so one that, was I have seen a couple of farmers carrying heavy stones and running, and that was taking yeah. place in front of a local administrations. Yeah, I, I think it's it's important. It's important and it's not important, but it, but those pictures were actually not taken in the context of, of the cotton harvest. The situation was around irrigation for wheat production. And so the people on the picture that are standing in the stream are, in fact, not farmers, but uh, officials from local institutions. And it's it's the situation, not to go into too much detail, but it, it's, it's around the dispute around whether or not there were water and irrigation available for wheat, some, some wheat fields in, in that area. That's, of course, completely unacceptable to to treat people in that way. And that view was shared by the government, by the president, by the prime minister and others. And as a result, the individual, the senior government official responsible for that was demoted from a very senior government official as, as minister of, of uh, agriculture and deputy prime minister. He was in a very public way fired from that position. And and he's now reappeared as as a as a local official in a, in a in a district in in Gizak, which you you know I I think it's important to stress that those pictures are not the norm. When people in Uzbekistan saw those pictures, they were stunned and appalled, and and it had consequences for the responsible mm. um, individual. Okay, okay. So um, authorities, uh, you know, have promised to change the practice of forced labor in. I want to believe that they are genuine uh, in what they say. So how much their actions correspondent with their promise? What are their challenges and are they in a position to cope with this challenge? So we will continue the discussion talking about these and many other issues very shortly. First, let me recap the debate that today on the Majlis Ready for Your Prado Liberty Central Asia podcast. I'm joined by Omida Niyazova, Director of Uzbek German Forum for Human Rights, Jonas Astrup, ILO's Chief Technical Advisor in Uzbekistan, Laziz Omilov, the Editor of Ready for Your Prado Liberty's Uzbek Services Cotton Monitoring Project, Portagram, Bruce Panier, Editor of Ready for Your Prado Liberty Central Asia blog, Kishlak Uwazi, I am Mohamed Tahir, Ready for Your Prado Liberty's Media Manager for South and Central Asia here in Washington, D.C. And we are doing a state's update about the forced labor in Uzbekistan as cotton fields. So it slipped from my tongue uh, twice in the first half of the discussion that the fact that there is no children in the cotton fields is a positive development. Also, positive is the Uzbek authorities' willingness to talk about these issues. So there is some sort of progress. Manuel, uh, we also agree that uh, the forced labor remains a serious issue as a whole. So on the question of how much of an issue is this, the size and scope of it, how much opinions differ between the NGOs in Uzbek authorities on some of the underlying problems and the way it needs to be solved? What are some of the main points of agreement and disagreement with the authorities, Omida? Let's start with you. Omida? Omida, are you with us? 
Yunus? Yes, I can hear you, Mohamed. I don't hear Omida. So let's start with this. Yes, would you like me to to, sure. to start and then sure. maybe Omida will, will sure. uh, join us again? Sure. In terms of numbers and, and data, we believe, and, and this is seems to be confirmed by the government, that approximately 2.6 million people hmm. picked cotton in 2018. Hmm. That The official number that I've seen is 2.63 million, to be um, exact. Hmm. I, I'm not aware of anybody challenging that number. Hmm. Where what is really interesting to look at is to see the different categories of pickers that make up these 2.6 million people. Hmm. So you have farm workers and their families. That is one category of, of cotton pickers. Then you have a second group of pickers, which are self-organized group, typically women very productive. You could call them top professional pickers. The third group is unemployed people. So Uzbekistan has approximately 600,000 young people joining the labor market every year. And that's a, a challenge and an opportunity for the country. But it has to create 600,000 new jobs every year to, to meet that challenge. And, and that is very difficult. So there is a significant number of unemployed people in Uzbekistan that also participate in the in the harvest. Yeah, that I, is the third yeah, group. Yeah, yeah, the I fourth understand. group and last group yeah. are employed people, so staff of institutions and companies. Those are the four categories, and the total number is, is 2.6 million. But where the, your opinion differs with the with the authorities on these uh, on these issues on these problems, the way to solve it. You know, the thing is, Mohammed, I, I really don't think that our opinion differs so much when. When we presented data to the government and we said we believe that there's 180,000 people who were forced to pick cotton in 2018, there was no disagreement. Okay, so uh, let's look into this from the NGO's perspective. Omida, I guess you are back. Uh, I saw your uh, microphone was muted yes, okay. earlier. So when you uh, compare your checklist in terms of the problems, the underlying problems, or the approach to our solution, so what are some of the main points of agreement and disagreement with the authorities? Uh, with regard with the numbers, so it's um, two years ago, we estimated that around 1 million, so something like 30% of people... Uh, uh, harvested cotton they'd been sent to work because they buy so they've been uh, the employees of uh, different public organizations and they've been forcibly sent to pick cotton and we counted the, these numbers from the documents we had from the interviews we conducted where people usually from different regions people who don't know each other of course they told us the same thing that around 30 percent of the employees of the staff they uh, have to go to to pick cotton and this year we found that many employees like uh, even the head of the organizations like tax inspectors or banks or even uh, police office um, chief of the pol pol policemen they've been requested to hire one sometimes up to five people to send them to uh, to pick cotton and pay them uh, themselves like from uh, their own pocket and uh, my uh, question also was to um uh, to Jonas that what percentage of let's say these voluntary pickers were hired by government employees so and were paid through uh, extorted money Wow. Is there any answer for that? I mean, if there's any quick, you know, please. In, in <laughs> yes. Let me be very specific. If somebody is asking you to pick cotton and you don't want to pick cotton, but you're being asked to pay for somebody else, that is a case of forced labor in that you have a negative consequence by declining to, to perform the work. So that is, by ILO definition, a case of forced labor. Now, if somebody is being paid and voluntarily goes and picks cotton, it is, it is not a case of forced labor. I don't have the... I mean, Umida is saying there are cases of, of people being asked to pay others to go and pick cotton. Yes, we are certainly aware of those people, uh, of those cases. I don't have a specific number or a percentage. I mean, simply th that would require a, diff a different approach in terms of monitoring. In that okay. those type of people would not be found in the cotton fields uh, okay. because they would uh, they would obviously 
uh, have paid others to to pick instead. I don't have a specific number, but we know it's a problem, and mm. the government agrees with that. Okay, so uh, Bruce, uh, you know, uh, the NGOs, ILO, and the authorities all seems to be uh, in agreement in one thing that this there is a problem; it, it needs resolution. And in terms of what is a problem or what should the approach be, they stand in a different corner of the page. So, how much of a problem is this when it, when we are talking about the solution? Well. <laughs> You know, I mean, that's going to be t- difficult to quantify, certainly. Yeah. You know, what What I would say, I suppose, is that uh, we know that this has been a practice in the country for a mm-hmm. long time. And, and, you know, the saying old habits die hard. So the, there is clearly an effort to try to remedy this situation. And, and it starts with the president declaring that he doesn't want any more forced labor in the country. Now, how you're going to hold everyone accountable for this kind of, you know, Uzbekistan's got a big population. How are you going to hold everyone accountable for these uh, misdeeds, I'll say? How are you going to identify them? How are you going to get, you know, get the message through that people shouldn't have to pay to not go to the cotton field so that that money can be handed over to someone who is willing to go to the cotton field? I mean, these are these are tough questions. It would require really the kind of monitoring that there's simply not enough manpower on the ground to do that you know i would to go back to the the picture of the guys with the stones and stuff mm. that i think uh you know that obviously that's a horrible story but for, for me what was really encouraging about that is that someone was willing to film that and post that on the internet and to the best of my knowledge although Lizzie's would know far better than me i don't think the people that that posted the video were ever punished certainly uh, and they might not have even been looking for them um so there seems to be a sense on the part of the civilian population that that what Mirzioyev said is what how it should be maybe that is the truth and you know i think the it's really going to be up to the because again this you know like i said this has been in the system for a long time this is going to have to be partially if not mostly a grassroots kind of movement where people show that they're not afraid to film or report these kind of abuses, you know, so that they can get their own message across, that might end up being one of the best ways of solving this and that we didn't see three or four years ago. Let's let's bring on uh, Laziz here. Laziz, you are running the entire project based on the uh, reports that you get from people, citizen journalists here. So uh, how you evaluate the activeness of people uh, reporting about the issues, the type of issues that Bruce just mentioned about people being punished standing in the ditches or the other violation of uh, human rights in the cotton fields. Is it more, less compared to previous years? Uh, certainly less. This year we received uh, less reports, but still there were a lot of them, but relatively less than it was previous year. And and again, what, what we could notice, like the local government was really going to the person who was like reporting to us, trying to talk to him, to him or to her, resolve the problem. And the final thing, what they were telling them because we, we are getting this information from direct source who, who was reporting to us and whose information was confirmed to a prosecutor's office uh, state prosecutor's office giving uh, like the order to the local prosecutor's office go and talk to them the moment they come there they resolve their problem and the last thing what they say next time if you have something to say don't don't tell it to us like tell it to, 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 to us and we'll resolve but what we see from the reports of people messaging us, they say we try to complain, but nothing is resolved. Hmm. Uh, we try to complain and eventually our complaints, they come back again to the regional government who comes and says, w- w- why are you complaining? You know, well, but again, like you guys were talking about the remedy and about more global things in cotton harvest. And while we were uh, talking about like local government and central government and that probably central government doesn't know what local government does and blah, blah, blah. But again, there are plenty of systematic problems in terms of agriculture and including in cotton sphere. Mm. Uh, for example, we had several cases uh, in 2018 when farmers first were giving money from the bank, loans to cultivate cotton but the moment when the government started understanding that the cotton plan is not going to be fulfilled this year they start like normally these loans to farmers were given on three percent interest rate for 14 months which is like one year two months but once the government started understanding that they are not getting the plan they started trying to get money back from those farmers earlier and Mm -hmm. we had those cases and we published them and they were confirmed as well and they started sort of getting money from farmers earlier which resulted in 
bankruptcy for those farmers because like they cannot pay their loans anymore they became bankrupt because still farmers are connected and they are not independent from hacking and that's the biggest problem because while central government is saying that we are doing everything to eradicate the forced labor and blah 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 in fact on the ground hacking are still the biggest bosses and whatever they say farmers must do that and we again had so many cases when farmers wanted to plant something else but they were forced to plant the cotton even though the law says that there are certain areas and Mirza was saying during his public speech that we are cutting the the amount of land given for the cotton production oh. but in fact we had tens of those stories when hakims were forcing farmers to plant the cotton even though that land was not for the cotton oh. you know on the top of that the biggest problem in 2018 like i'm talking about systematic things so uh, in 2018 when all this started happening government didn't give any subsidies any support to those farmers like some of them faced the bankruptcy because 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 of this policy yeah yeah uh, yeah i i guess s- i was following from some- your reports that couple of farmers were also ended up in jail for not being able yeah, to pay back I- and yeah. what is more is that yeah. we had the cases when MIB this is the like uh, the organization created within the prosecutor's uh, office that guys were going to the houses of farmers and even though they still had some time to 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 fulfill their cotton plan and so on they were coming to their houses taking their carpets TVs mm. personal things you know taking their cars we reported like recently the case when the farmer uh, lost his almost new car just because he couldn't fulfill the plan and he's like yeah i want to give up the farming and i want to get away from this but now like i'm having problems and they are sort of pressuring me mm-hmm. we have several such cases and we can see that systematically high teams are still like bosses there yeah. and i think the same thing applies to the head of public organizations to the head of state organizations when hakim wants something they cannot say no and we we heard many cases when those people were saying we are just afraid to say no we we, we cannot so we, are, we are like soldiers we are given the order and we do that you know what the laziz was talking about kind of brings back me to some of the bigger questions like you know these are just few of many systematic problems that we are talking about when we look into Uzbekistan as agriculture sector and again this is not just one region that that's pay, facing this challenge this is in Tashkent this is Jizak and many other places the, the same complaints are coming so it you know raises a question in my mind is let's imagine that Uzbek authorities genuinely want to resolve this issue so are they really qualified to do this do they understand the problem Well, that's a good question. The people that we engage with certainly understand the labor problems and uh, I, I think it's it's let me try and, and, and answer your, your question and also some of Lassis's points. I think it's um, there is in fact a government strategy to reduce eliminate the role of the government and hokims in cotton production. So there is a deliberate strategy to put in place uh, get private investors in to privatize the the cotton uh, industry. and the vehicle that's being piloted currently are so called textile clusters where investors will take over the role of the government if you like for a certain area and move by the cotton from the uh, uh, farmers there are, there are different models that vary it would probably be too detailed to get into that now but the overall idea is that moving up the value chain manufacture textile and garments rather than exporting raw cotton and have private investors run the industry rather than the government now that is happening and those textile clusters are being implemented but I mean, the outcome is not changing the reality on the ground uh, you know that's why I, I think they, a, it raises yeah. question in me like i mean are they really qualified to handle this issue do you mean to grow cotton or no, to, no, the, hand- to deliver the promise that they are making to people Yes, I, I fir- well look, Mohammed. I, I firmly believe that the government is clear in its commitment, and I think they are th- coming back to this th- to the beginning of the discussion about the how can you say the contrast between the central government and the local government and some of the dynamics we're seeing there. I, I think it's 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 um, it's uh, I definitely think that the strategy of the government to eradicate forced labor is is um, is sound. I think the strategy to reduce cotton production by 20% by 2020, the strategy to put in place textile clusters and get private investors in rather than having the government have a quota system as it's the case now, 
I think those are the right type of instruments. So I, yes, to answer your question, yes, I firmly believe that they are qualified and I firmly believe they're on the right track. In fact, I think they deserve our support. I think that Uzbekistan deserve the support of, of us mm. as international players. Uh, they deserve the support to realize this uh, commitment. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I hope that begins to answer your question at least. Okay, thank you very much. We really need to end the discussion too, but yeah, um, Omida, Omida, your thoughts definitely on this. So what do you think about the Uzbekistan strategy? And Jonas also said that they are on the right track, but they also need our help. So I believe you guys are willing to help them. So um, Yes, unfortunately, I see that there is a fear of serious reforms in, in to provide the serious reforms in agriculture which means that this would start with uh, land reform and the agriculture sector itself so we have said many times that farmers should be given the opportunity to choose what they plant they should be relieved from having to fulfill the quota and just a law to pay taxes, like in other countries. They need to be protected from threats of confiscation of their land. Oh. As if farmers are given like ownership on their land, they feel that they can invest more and develop uh, it uh, accordingly. And uh, uh, when we talk about forced labor, we usually uh, tell about the many people, like the employees of different organizations mobilized to forcibly to pick cotton. But of course, the situation of farmers is the, the, maybe a root of the problem, because for many, many farmers to grow cotton is simply not profitable. That's why they don't have enough money to attract enough voluntary labor. And knowing this, the heads of the regions, Hakims, just forcibly mobilized and sent employees of organizations to work on these farms. And this is the paradox, actually, in the country with such a high uh, level of unemployment. We see that mm. uh, government use the people who have their jobs already okay. to go and pick cut us. Okay, thank you, Umid Yazva, Director of Uzbek German Forum for Human Rights, Jonas Astrup, ILO's Chief Technical Advisor in Uzbekistan, Laziz Omilov, the editor of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberties, Uzbek Services Cotton Project, Pachtagram, Bruce Panier, editor of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberties, Kishlok Owozi blog, which focuses on Central Asia. Thank you very much, colleagues, for joining us today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And Thank this is it from me, Mohammed Tahir, host of the Majlis podcast here in Washington, D.C. Until next week, bye-bye.